Okay, welcome everybody. Um, normally we start with a motivation that is uh, something very Buddhist, and uh, today I think that we'll still connect with altruism, but explore a motivation that's more secular. In particular, a motivation that might help with those difficult conversations with people that we might not agree with. And so let's start the course by thinking of some of those things. And so setting the motivation, start by thinking. It is quite possible regarding my own political views. It is quite possible that I am wrong. Just hold open the possibility. I might be wrong. It is possible that my knowledge is incomplete. It is possible that my views are outdated or will become outdated and old-fashioned over time. And then think, even if that is the case, even if I am wrong or partially wrong, I can still contribute to the conversation can still share and connect. I still have a life experience and a point of view that can collaborate in with the thoughts of others. And because I know that my knowledge may be incomplete, because I know that I'm not perfect, may I listen deeply. May I hear deeply the words of others, the meaning of those words. The intention of those words. The insights and the sufferings of others. May I hear them deeply. And may all of this work go into the development of my own mental continuum. May all of this work contribute to my own inner development so that my outer work is more skillful and effective. So that the lasting result of my work is a legacy of kindness, compassion, and wisdom. I think it's really important to hold open the idea that you might be wrong. Yeah, because if you don't hold open the idea that you might be wrong, how on earth can you invite that opportunity from someone else? Right? How can you make it feel safe for them to change their mind? Yeah, so if you're trying to talk to someone and you're trying to convince them of your view or connect with them despite differing views or anything like that, if you're starting from the place of um, I'm, I could be wrong or I'm incomplete in my knowledge um, and I really want to find a way for us to grow together, to heal together, it's a really different energy than if you start from I'm right, you're wrong, I need to convince you because you're stupid and ignorant. Yeah, or I need to convince you because uh, you're closed-minded and full of afflictions and I just need to get through to you, I need to pound it into you, I need to force feed you what is right because you're just so ignorant. Not gonna go well, right? It's not gonna go well. So, so do, you, do you understand the way that if you hold open the possibility of yourself being wrong, that that helps make it safe for the other person to explore that they might be wrong. Does it, does it make sense? If, you know, even if you don't change your views, even if you're not wrong, just holding that possibility creates safety. So 
I think that this is a really interesting way to approach not just um, work within the activism sphere or work within your professional sphere or your family, but also as a way to approach, um, you know, Dharma studies, that what I know so far has worked so far, and there might be more to the story. And if I'm closed minded, I'm never going to touch another level of profundity. If I live in certainty, all possibilities are ended. So this is not just a mentality for some sort of political activism work. This is a mentality we want to bring to everything. But the problem is, is that if we hold open the possibility that we might be wrong, it becomes very difficult for us to act. Yeah? If you feel certain, it's very easy to act. Yeah, I feel certain about this. This is definitely right. This is definitely wrong. I can definitely act and feel full of conviction. It's much easier to make a choice, to make a decision, to move forward with something if you feel certainty. So this is the point that we want to explore with our work is you can act while still holding the possibility that you might be wrong. And our pride is going to freak out about that. And so hold space for your pride to freak out about that. That what you believed last year, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, might be outdated. And it might have been completely rational good and serve a function in that time. And now it doesn't. And that doesn't make you bad. And that doesn't mean that that time was wasted or lost. It just means we need to keep bringing a flexible mind to everything that is willing to evolve when it meets new information. So when you first met any kind of activist work, I'm, I'm guessing that most of us heard the phrase, the personal is political and the political is personal. Did most of us hear that at some point? Yeah. And there are pros and cons to that approach, <laughs> right? There are pros and cons. Because of course, if you take something personally, you're much more likely to do something about it. You're much more likely to then engage in things to soothe, transform, change, etc. If you don't take it personally, then it's kind of like, yeah, well, anyway, it's rough for them. What to do, life. You know, it's much easier to be passive if you don't th take things personally. So this is what we already knew. What I think we need to bring to that knowledge is, as soon as you make something personal, identify with it, and the sense of other is stronger, which means the sense of threat is stronger, which means divisiveness is more possible, which means connecting is harder. Do you know what I mean? So if you're feeling like, I'm taking this personal, this is personal, this is really important, you guys, then you've identified with it, and then the othering is much more concrete. So it's, it's again, the same idea of, you can say this is personal, but not so personal that you've taken it personally. Because then if someone disagrees with your idea, they are disagreeing with you, and then you feel a sense of, I need to defend. And if someone agrees with your idea, they are agreeing with you, and then you feel attached to them and want more of them and want them closer. Do you know what I mean? So it's like having the space to say, it is worthwhile to bring things into my personal sphere of, uh, you know, what is my responsibility? What is my experience? But to think it's me and mine can become its own trap. So these are just some of the ideas that, that I want us to try and explore. Um, but basically, when we talk about equanimity in Buddhism, we're talking about a few different areas of thought. And it's very common to blur them together and think that we're talking about the same thing. In Buddhism, when we talk about equanimity, on one hand, we're talking about a balanced mind. On the other hand, we're talking about an unbiased mentality. Yeah, an impartial mentality. So a balanced mind can make you think that then you have to be neutral about everything. And that's not what's being said. A balanced mind means a steady mind that is able to hold many possibilities simultaneously 
and is able to hold many points of view, being able to kind of put yourself in lots of people's different shoes to try to see things from many different perspectives. It doesn't mean that you're neutral. It means that you're expansive. It doesn't mean that you're neutral. It means that you're not agitated. Do you feel the difference? Right, so to say my mind is equanimous means my mind is steady and clear and balanced. Now with that steady, clear and balanced mind, I bring in an immeasurable equanimity intention. Yeah, so the mind that's steady, then you invite some thoughts into that steady mind. You invite some intentions into that steady mind, which are whether I categorize someone as a friend, an enemy or a stranger, or someone I like, someone I dislike, or someone I'm indifferent to. I'm not going to pretend that I don't do that. What I'm going to say is, despite doing that, my goodwill is going to be unbiased. My heart is going to be open evenly, because I recognize that these labels I give people are coming from me, not coming from them. Are you with me? Yeah. So you're having unbiased goodwill, you're having impartial goodwill, you're wishing everyone to have happiness and the causes of happiness in the deep way, not the superficial way that their egos and afflictions want, but you're wanting them to have happiness and you're wanting them to have relief from suffering, while at the same time acknowledging that your mind still has a tendency to categorize and of course just karmically or um, habitually we have different rapport, different affinities with different people. So to say I have equanimity towards everyone doesn't mean you're inviting everyone to dinner, right? It doesn't mean that you're hanging out and going for walks with everyone equally. It doesn't mean that the content of your conversation is the same with everyone. It means that your mentality is. Yeah, so these are really common misunderstandings about equanimity. People think that now we have to be, be the same to everyone. And it's not being the same to everyone. It's having the same open-hearted goodwill that can adjust according to relationship and circumstance, but it's coming from that foundation of equanimity. Do you have questions so far about equanimity, what it is? a balanced state of mind in terms of mentality and then the intention you bring to it without partiality, without bias. These are two kinds of equanimity and we're trying to bring them together. There's um, a third kind that you will hear talked about in Buddhism just so you don't miss it. Um, and that's the kind that we talk about in meditation when um, you're developing the nine levels of mental abidance and you're looking at the five faults and cultivating the eight antidotes. The last antidote is what's called applied equanimity. And that's the antidote to overdoing your antidotes. <laughs> okay, so that's the third kind of equanimity. And we're not really going to talk about that one today. But for you Buddhist scholars or Buddhist nerds know there are three types of equanimity. That's the third one, but we're not going to talk about that today. It's related to meditation. Yeah, so the feeling of equanimity, the intention of equanimity, these are the things that we want to bring because they create this really stable foundation to put love and compassion into. If we don't have equanimity with love and compassion, then it's completely afflicted love and compassion. It's not real love and compassion. It's like a reward we give to people we like. Yeah, I like you, so here's my love. I like you, so here's my compassion. You know, it's a reward rather than an actual mentality that we've cultivated cleanly, divorced from self-cherishing. Yeah. Yeah, thoughts so far? So slowly, slowly, right? The, the idea here is that you don't have to be perfect in order for this to be useful. You don't have to have perfect equanimity. You don't have to have perfect understanding and knowledge of every political issue. What, what you want to have is the intention to. The intention to. The intention to try to be equanimous. The intention to try to understand. And that means that you can bring the wisdom of your life experience in a way that's not so charged with needing to be right or needing to dominate. 
but you're still able to share what you know because what you know from your life is unique and valuable and helps with the whole process of world peace, which is, of course, what we're all aiming for, right? We want world peace. <laughs> we want a harmonious society where people don't hurt each other. This is what we want. But the avenues to get there, we have to kind of look at what's in front of us and what harm is being done right now. How do we address what harm is being done right now? How do we look inward to see how we're perpetuating what harm is being done right now, etc. With the background mentality, of course, we're working towards this greater big picture. Yeah. So in cultivating equanimity, the other danger is that we pretend to have more than we do, or we speak in a way that is unskillful. And we've probably heard our friends do this. Hopefully we can hear ourselves when we do it. So some, sometimes what false equanimity or incomplete equanimity looks like is the kind of unskillful speech that says, sure, this group is suffering, but everyone is suffering. You know this one? We're not pretending that everyone else doesn't suffer. We get it, right? We get it, we're on board. The whole premise is the first noble truth. There is suffering, we're all suffering. That is not um, in dispute. What we're talking about is the way in which this group in front of us is suffering is particularly significant right now. Therefore, let's give it particular energy and emphasis. Yeah, some of you have seen this, you know, cartoon going around the internet where it's like there's all these houses and one of them is on fire and the people whose house isn't on fire is like, why are you giving them so much attention? We have a house too. It's like, yeah, but theirs is on fire. So let's just shift focus for a moment, shall we? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it feels like sometimes if you don't acknowledge everyone's suffering, that you're negating everyone's suffering and you're not. Right. You're just shifting emphasis to where the pain is the most significant. See all of humanity as different parts of the same body. If one part is hurt, it has an effect over the whole system. But it makes sense that the part that is hurting the most significantly gets the immediate attention. It's not to say there aren't other parts of the body or there aren't other parts of humanity. Yeah. So, you know, mistaken ways of approaching equanimity are also to pretend that we have an equanimity that we don't have. And we say things like, I don't see gender. I don't see race. I don't see age. I don't see economic status. I see everyone equally which is baloney, right? It's baloney. It's how we would like to be. It is not how we are. Yeah. And pretending that that's how we are actually causes more harm than good. Because what you're really saying is, I don't see the suffering of your gender. I don't see the suffering of your race. I don't see the suffering of your economic status. I don't see your suffering. That's what you're really saying. By saying, I don't see any of that. You're saying, I don't see your suffering. So this is what we have to be really careful of, isn't it? Because we're really trying so hard to be good people. We want to be good people and we identify as good people. And then if we find a weak spot or a place that's incomplete in our knowledge, our shame can make us so defensive. You know, our shame of not understanding everything can make us so defensive. And, you know, defensiveness can look like anger, but it can also look like depression. You know, we can be like, oh, I don't know what to do, therefore I can't do anything. I don't know really what the right thing is. I'm just, I don't know, I don't have mental space to get educated about every issue. I don't have mental space to look at every group of people. I don't know. I'm trying to recycle. Come on, give me a break. I'm a nice person, right? <laughs> um, and that kind of defensiveness and that kind of sadness can be a type of laziness, right? 
not not a laziness in the normal sense. It's it's like the laziness that says progress and change are for stronger people than me. Yeah, and that's not true. You know, progress and change are opportunities that we all can touch into and the conditions of our lives are different so sometimes we'll have more and sometimes we'll have less but if it's a background premise that what we want to work towards is cultivating kindness cultivating peace then we just kind of bring that to whatever activity we're into whether it's work whether it's politics whether it's family etc just bringing the same mentality everywhere yeah. What, what other things um, have you seen come up with people that are really trying hard to do the right thing, but it's not quite right? In yourself or in your friends, what are some other ways of trying to be equanimous, but kind of missing some of the point or doing it in an unskillful way? So I think that the most, the worst thing I always see and also in myself is when afflicted emotions get absorbed into this orbit you're trying to be i don't know a champion of one group of people or of wrongdoing and then you become agitated and angry or jealous and i think it was particularly it's very relevant to the the current events right now like this week there were two protests there was two i mean there were like dozens of protests and some of them are for the women and some of them are for the unemployed and some of them are for the Palestinians. And, and you're like, and when you go to the protest, then there's a lot of shouting and there's a lot of booing. And there's like this feeling that being a champion of this cause also means being angry with someone or um, channeling the, the, your anger towards a certain person or persons. And that's get, that gets mixed up with my activist cause. Definitely. And it's, it's so interesting to see, like, there's the, whatever group of people it is that's the oppressed group of people and their anger, and then there's the people that want to champion them and their relationship to that. And that's kind of the interesting point of practice. It's like an oppressed people of any kind are going to react in a whole series of different ways, just like people who are experiencing grief relate to grief in a whole series of different ways. So kind of the way people respond to their own suffering and their oppression is not really our business. It's more just like, what can we do? What can we offer you? Some of you will speak clearly and calmly. Some of you will throw things. Some of you will steal things. Some of you will do this. Some of you will do that. It's all a response to grief. I get the grief. What can I do to help soothe your grief? What can I do to change things so you don't feel this way anymore? You know, what can I do? But what we often do is say, oh, then I should be mad too, right? So you guys are mad. So I should be mad, right? Okay, I'll be mad. What am I mad about? Oh, my mother is so irritating. Yeah, black lives matter, <laughs> right? Really just mad about your mother. You're trying to bring your anger to meet their anger because that's solidarity, right? And now you just have like an afflictions party and it's like, let's use your afflictions and my afflictions and just have a whole afflictions extravaganza. And it's just like not helping, <laughs> right? So, so I think there, that we have to separate from right now, whatever protest we're in, whatever thing we're trying to change, are we speaking from the place of being the oppressed party? Sometimes we are. Or are we speaking from the place of being the ones supporting the oppressed party? And if, if we're the ones supporting, we need to listen to them and ask, what do you need? What can we do? Should we just step back and let you guys say what you've needed to say and amplify your voices? Would you like us to come and join you? But like, we're, we're here, right? We're here for you. Just like if your best friend had a divorce, you wouldn't like come in guns blazing and say, I'm going to kill your ex, right? You'd say, what would you like me to do to support you in this difficult time, <laughs> right? Right, but you know how, so take it back to something really accessible and personal like that, right? If your best friend was going through it, going through something, something unrelated to politics particularly, take a divorce. Of course, some friends would say, I must 
beat up your ex. I must uh, tell you all the horrible things I know about your ex. I must reinforce all of your anger about your ex. I must do that because that's just being a good friend, right? And then some people might be more skillful and say, what would you like? <laughs> Here's some of the things I have to offer to support you in this difficult time. If you need to vent about your ex, I'm here for you. I'm holding the space for you. Doesn't mean I agree or disagree. I'm just holding the space for you because you are grieving. Yeah. Um, it's your pain. I'm not going to co-opt your pain and now make it about me. You know how you would do if it was just your best friend? So this is the way we need to think of whatever oppressed community we're trying to support. This is our human family. We need to follow their lead about what is going to actually help them with their grief. You know? Um, and, you know, we might look at ourselves and go, oh, I am that kind of friend that when some other, when one of my friends is suffering, I charge in and I'm like, I'll save you or I'll defend you or, you know, we might be that kind of friend. And that's worth looking at because that's probably what kind of ally we are as well. And is that actually helping? <laughs> right? It might be soothing in the immediate but is it just reinforcing someone's afflictions and perpetuating the cycle of violence? Yeah. So there's kind of like processes that we go through when we're trying to support. And the first one needs to be, let's just meet them. Yeah, and that's, let's not come in with all of our assumptions about how we would respond to this or how we think we sh people should respond to this or anything like that. Let's just see where they're at and listen for a minute before we have any kind of plan, any kind of agenda. How about we just listen to what they're saying, you know? And then make our next plan. So whether it's the climate or it's gender or it's race or it's, you know, sexuality or gender expression or whatever the case may be, you know, we wanna just really be having this mind that is listening really deeply to the people we wanna support listening deeply to our own issues about being someone who's oppressed in some way, and also listening to the other side, really deeply listening to the other side, because maybe they're yelling because they don't feel heard either. Even if they're wrong, they're suffering too, right? The fact that they're wrong doesn't mean that they're not suffering. Hard for us to sit with. Um, I remember some of you were with me. I went to one of the, um, uh, what is it? Memorial Day celebrations in Tel Aviv. It was really controversial, right? And there was like all these protesters and um, I don't speak Hebrew. So all I could hear was yelling. And so I found it so interesting that if I don't understand the language, it is so much easier to see the pain. If I knew what they were saying, I probably would have been outraged. But because I had no idea what they were talking about, I was just hearing, like, just like screaming, I don't understand, but I feel like something's been taken from me. I don't understand, but I feel like you are minimizing my pain. And it just, you could just see the grief through all of the anger so much easier. But we get lost in the words and triggered by the words and want to address the words that are incorrect or misunderstanding the situation. And we're not kind of going a few layers under to see they're coming from some place of grief as well. What's going on for them? It's not the job of an oppressed person to try and figure out the suffering of their oppressor. It's not. But if we're going to be an ally, we could try to do that because they might actually hear us because we look like them. Do you know what I mean? So... If you're someone who is in the oppressed group, if you can understand the, the suffering of your oppressor, you're doing amazing and that's remarkable, but it shouldn't be something we expect. Yeah, it shouldn't be something we expect of ourselves if we're in an oppressed class or something we should expect of people who are feeling oppressed. It's not their job to figure out the suffering of their oppressor. If they do, it's wonderful. If they do, it can really help. But really the job of allies is to see how can we talk to our quote own people and get them in alignment with things that are kind. You know? So, you know, this is so delicate because people really want to hear what they already believe. 
don't they? People really want to hear what they already believe. So to get someone to actually hear you takes so much kindness from your side, so much patience from your side, and they actually have to have an opening. If they have an opening to hear you, then if you bring all your skills, you bring all your compassion and patience, maybe, maybe something will get in. But we shouldn't expect it. Yeah, we should just think, if nothing else, I'm getting better at the conversation. If nothing else, I'm getting better at managing my own reactions and managing my own negative states of mind. So it's worth a try. Even if it, quote, fails, it's still useful for my practice. So I should still try and be brave and try and do it whenever there seems like there is an opening. But if there's not an opening, there's no need to just scream at the other side with the other side screaming at you and hope that, that one of you is going to crack and listen. You know? Because then even if you're right, you're wrong. Yeah. That's not to say that the oppressed party doesn't get to scream. They get to scream. Yeah, if they need to, if they need to. Um, we'll go a little bit more deeply into how to navigate being the oppressed party later in the day. Right now, kind of we're talking from the perspective of being an ally. Yeah. So, um, you know, all of us have a way in which we could feel ourselves a minority. You know, there's some way that all of us could feel ourselves a minority. Um, and, you know, that feeling of being a minority is sometimes not a big deal and sometimes is a huge deal, depending on the politics of the time or the people around you. And so it's, it's useful to kind of sit in that identity and explore things from that identity. But right now, speaking from the perspective of how do we support those um, who are really facing suffering, we need to try to keep equanimity really balanced mind. Yeah. Do you feel any kind of like, yes, but, yes, but, or like resistance coming up to any of these ideas so far? It's, it's completely okay if there are. Yeah, you know? Yes, you, you, you're basically talking about the conversation between people. But what, a, what, what my, what my uh, problem is, is the conversation with people in power and the system. And it always feels like it's are the people and the government and are the people and the police and are the people and the army. And we're always trying to find a way to, I, I, I don't know like how to stop saying this us and them because if I really rationalize this, I realize that the people in the army are people as well and the people in the police are people as well and the people in the government are people as well who want to support themselves and, but, it's just, I, I can't understand people abuse of their power. It's really hard to... It's, it's hard if you don't have power to understand how people would abuse power. But if you can try to think of some area in your life where you do have power. Maybe it's only that you're the auntie and you have lots of nieces and nephews and you're the grown-up in charge of them. Maybe that's the only place you have any kind of authority in your life, right? Is with your little nieces and nephews or with your children. Um, maybe you have authority in like one group of your friends where they look to you to be the strong one or the one that understands things. Or maybe there's some event that you were in charge of. But to kind of like put yourself not in the place of the authority figures that you don't understand, but to put yourself in the place of yourself when you've had power. And maybe you've managed your power really well. Maybe you've been a benevolent dictator. Maybe you've been really um, kind and understanding and deep listening. And I'm guessing that somewhere in the back of your mind, there has been a little bit of, I could throw my weight around. I could actually tell people what to do. Normally I don't. Normally in my life, no one listens to me, but here, maybe someone will do what I say. You know, there's like, like a little evil dictator in the back of our mind that a little bit enjoys the power. Try to find them, even if they're really tiny, even if they're really quiet, even if they don't come out and cause any trouble. Try to find that place in yourself that when you have some sort of authority, a little bit likes it. Can you find that somewhere in you in some context? And then imagine if your profession 
celebrated that. And imagine that all the people around you celebrated that. How hard it would be. Yeah, like power over your pets, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, think that pets is a really good example. Think of um, if you want a cuddle from your cat or your dog, you just pick them up and cuddle them, whether they like it or not. You're like, I'm having a cuddle, right? And your cat's like, fine, whatever, right? <laughs> but, you know, I mean, we, we really are like, too bad, I'm in charge, ha <laughs> ha. You're mine, squishy thing, yeah? I mean, it is interesting, right? So, so we have to find that place in ourselves so that we soften a little bit when we meet it in other people that are just out of control with it and just obnoxious and damaging with it. We have to find that tiny piece in ourselves that recognizes it is possible for someone to get into that headspace. You know, like I'm, I'm glad the conditions have been that I haven't fallen into that too often, but I could if the conditions were wrong. Yeah, if I had wrong conditions around me all of my life, all of my professional life, of course, I'd like to think that my habits of compassion and kindness would flow forward. Maybe they would. But, you know, if we'd lived the same life as the people who abuse power, we would abuse power in the same way as them because everyone's mind is of a similar type. It's just the conditions and habits that have been different. So having kind of a connection and an understanding of them is not the same thing as giving them permission to abuse power. But it means you can start from a place of shared humanity rather than starting from a place of how dare you? You know, you're starting from a place of shared humanity, which means you're steady. Yeah, and when you're steady, creativity is accessible. Creative problem solving, creative communicating, you know, all of your life skills are available to you when you're so clear. When your mind is agitated, you'll forget things that you already know. You'll forget techniques and things to say that you've already gotten organized. Yeah, the more agitated you are, the fewer possibilities there are. You know, so when we're looking at authority figures who abuse authority, I think we do have to sit with, how could that ever be me? And if you can't find how that could ever be you, there's a level of blindness to our self-awareness. Yeah, it would look different because we're a different person. Yeah, we've had different life experiences. But to say it isn't there is a misunderstanding of human nature. Do you know? Let me... Hey, good morning, everyone. And thanks for organizing this day. Uh, maybe just an, an issue that I, I'm finding uh, challenging uh, in my practice is that more than... Uh, working with the out groups, so-called, I find it very difficult sometimes in, in um, uh, overcoming the suspiciousness, pride, uh, uh, the challenges within the in groups. It's like we, we want to <laughs> talk about the, the solidarity or shared humanity or whatever, but many times there, especially in Israel, I think, but perhaps other places as well, we find it so difficult to even collaborate in, in small things just to have the power that we need in order to bring about change because we're too self-absorbed and too proud and too, we, we think that we know the way to bring the change and then we just fail because it's just two of small groups that can't do much. So I haven't figured that out yet, but Well, you know, we have to start with, um, <clears throat> what, the Hippocratic Oath, right? First, do no harm. Um, when are we the one that uh, is trying to dominate as opposed to trying to connect? You know, sometimes when we're so certain that we're right, then we're trying to squash the other side or um, make the other side see how stupid and foolish they are, or we're trying to convince them and we're trying to wrestle them into submission. And um, maybe we'll win for a minute. And that's the problem, is that if you're very dominant and very aggressive, you can bully someone into agreeing with you. And then when, you, when they get their power back, they'll come back and be the bully, won't they? 
you know, and this is why life is the way it is. This is why our political situation is the way it is, is if you bully someone long enough, they'll say that they agree with you just to stop all the pressure. But then as soon as the pressure starts to lift, then they become the bully because they have all this pain. And, you know, this is not the way that we want to live and, you know, see history for details. <laughs> you know? So when we're looking at, even if we're pretty, you know, 90% sure that we're right, if we're 100% sure that we're right, we're probably wrong. But if we're 90% sure, right, then we're doing well. We've kept the 10% opening that will um, help bridge things, connect with things. If you have some sort of feeling, yeah, I am right, I've got the good thing to say here, I want to share it with people. If someone is not listening to you, stop shouting at them. Try something else. This is from the perspective of the ally, right? The perspective of the ally. Um, we have to be creative. We have to be creative. What is the way to reach people's hearts? What is the way to um, make it feel safe to change your mind? How do we f help people feel safe enough to change their mind? Sometimes we have to create policies that prevent the harm of people who are just going to do the wrong thing their whole life. They've just been so thoroughly conditioned to the wrong way of thinking. They've been so thoroughly indoctrinated with harmful views that all we can do is to try and create structures to kind of prevent them from harming. That does need to happen sometimes, but if we go too far and decide, and now I'm going to punish them for it, and now I'm going to retaliate that they did it, you know, it's just creating more of the same. So if we can kind of get in our mind, there are, of course, some people that will never change in this life. There are some people that will actively do the wrong thing, and there's no convincing them. So we might need some policies that help prevent them from crossing the line. But it needs to be something that is about protecting, not about punishing. Which is difficult because some people only respond to consequences. Yeah, but if even the idea of consequences has with it, this is, some, this is a consequence people need to experience in order to examine the choices that they made, not because they're bad and need to be whipped. You know, so it might be that someone who abuses their th authority needs to be fired, needs to be put in jail, needs to have this, these various things happen to them. But if it's done with a mentality that says, this is the natural consequence of your actions, rather than you are bad and need to be punished. It's a really different way, isn't it? So, you know, what Gandhi would say, right? Be the change, <laughs> right? Be the change you want to see. It, it is really hard, especially because most of us are used to using passion in order to act. We're, we're used to using anger to get us off of our bum and to do something about it. That's how we're used to getting motivated to do something. And so how do you get motivated to do something if you're not angry? You just see an injustice that needs to be righted. You know, how do you keep acting? If you feel calm and happy and stable and good in your life and, you know, mentally you've found some peace, then our afflictions say, so relax, <laughs> right? I'm fine. I mean, sure, okay, the world's going to get hotter, but I'll be dead before then. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Sure, the planet's getting hotter, but, you know, I'm a good enough person. I'm going to go for another drive. You know, there's ways that we can kind of justify inaction, if we're very comfortable. So the training that we're trying to work in is how to act even when we're comfortable, maybe even only act when we're feeling comfortable and stable. Maybe, maybe. It's difficult because it's different, it's new, isn't it? This is not the way that we were trained by our activist community. It's like, get angry, you know, because that'll make you do something. And that might have served a function way back in the day, and now let's try and self-direct some evolution. You know, from a Buddhist perspective, anger is not justified, but anger is defined as the wish to harm. The wish to harm is not justified. That's not to say it's not understandable. <laughs> it is understandable. It's just not the way that we want to live. 
right? The old saying, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Yeah. So yes, what motivates us? Start from equanimity. On top of equanimity, build in compassion and loving kindness. And don't pretend that you have. <laughs> right? Don't pretend that you have. Just try. Just try. And, you know, keep your sense of humor. And I think that it's, it's so easy to be frustrated at people that seem stuck in their ways if we can hold that so that we don't get stuck in our ways. Yeah. Um, when, you know, when I was first going into the activist movement, I mean, my family is an activist family, right? My parents are old hippies. They still have really, really long hair, you know, and they're, um, they unrepentantly still listen to Jim Morrison and the doors and, you know, like they're just unrepentant old hippies. And um, that was how I was brought up. And there's sometimes when um, I would bring them my politics as someone of a different generation and they would say, we're progressive people. Sure, we understand, but they were actually a little stuck about some things about, I don't know, gender politics or sexual identity or, you know, they were like a little old fashioned. And, um, and I could feel them not be defensive about the issue, but be defensive that they were old fashioned. You know what I mean? So it's like, they're like, of course, wanting to be compassionate, progressive people. And they've identified as compassionate, progressive people for 20, 30, 40 years. And their views haven't um, been re-educated and rejigged and reinformed, you know, each generation. And so they got a little stuck in their ways. And I had to, you know, needle them a little bit as a teenager and say, you guys, come on, you're old fashioned, come on. And they're like, oh, no, that's what we said to our parents. No, <laughs> you know. And so now we're adults, right? And so how do we make sure that we don't get stuck in our ways? How do we make sure we don't get stuck in our ways? This is why you have to hold the possibility that we might be wrong or we might not have all the information or that at some point our views might get outdated. Yeah, we have to hold that possibility, not just for the sake of the present time conversation, but for the sake of the fact that it might actually be true. <laughs> might actually be true that what we think is true now is true for now and then needs some evolution as as years go by yeah i have many thoughts but uh, i wish to say that if you come uh, balanced right with your mind and you say the first thing you say is i'm open-minded open-hearted i'm not judging you please i want to listen to you i want to learn then while doing that, you can actually find doors to the other person's mind and use that in order to explain, you know, half of my family are the ones who are sitting right now in the occupied territories. If you ask me if I'm on their side or on a Aviv a Tataski side, he's here with us today and I'm so happy because he works with Palestinian villages and Dharma, and they do a great job. I sit with my family many times, not judging them, just trying and understanding their point of view regarding land, etc. And I found it so helpful by understanding their feelings towards the land, to start with the land and say, what if? Let's see it in another way, you know, and it works. And then I see the Black Flags movement. Some of my friends here are a part of it. I see the rage and the hatred. And you know, right now, more than the coronavirus, this really puts me in despair <laughs> because they're so outraged. They don't understand that what they're doing is the complete opposite because they create now a group that defends the government, defends Bibi Netanyahu, because they need defense now. Well, and I, I think this is the point, is that everyone makes sense to themselves, right? People make sense to themselves, isn't it? And if they feel that you love them, they might listen to you, right? This is your family, right? If they feel like you're judging them and you think that they're backward and ignorant, of course they're going to just get defensive and shut down. But Everyone, not yeah. just family, everyone, that's the point. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so, so I think that if we do start from the perspective of, of course, they make sense to themselves. <laughs> they make sense to themselves. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I think that there is something really important um, in what you're saying and also to be careful to not kind of come in as the authority of or the representative of all things open-minded um, because that is the case and it's not the case because we still haven't realized the nature of our own identity and our own ways of identification. Do you know what I mean? And so honestly, I think it's, it's skillful to live. I want to be an open-minded person, but not necessarily to introduce yourself <laughs> as an open-minded person. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it's more like I would like to introduce myself as someone who is interested in you. I'm interested yeah. in you and what you have to yeah. say. I may or may not agree, but I'm interested in you. Let's talk. You not know? condescendingly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. That's the point. Not exactly. with range. Check your motivation before you go there. What do yeah. you want to achieve? How can we get closer? How can, you know, that's the, that's the main thing. Yeah, and, and I love that you're having these conversations with your family because that is, you know, they love you, you're, you're tied by blood, and so it makes it harder to dismiss you because you're in each other's lives. And, you know, if we can do these, these brave conversations, <coughs> it's, it's huge um, and, and scary, you know, it's scary. But if you're starting from that, I'm interested in you, I love you, I'm listening to you, and there's some ways that you think that are worrying <laughs> you know, but they worry me because I love you and I see the harm it brings. You know, if there's some way to communicate that without communicating the words of that, because, uh, you know, part of holding open that I might be wrong prevents condescension and it prevents you being patronizing because you're really like, look, I have an idea about this. I do. I do. I'm not going to pretend that I don't, but I really want to hear why you think the way you do. It could be that I'm missing the point somewhere. It really could be, even though I don't think I am, but I might be, I might be, I might be, <laughs> you know? It's so hard because we're so sure that we're right and so are they, <laughs> you know? So, so offering that opportunity to have a safe, safe conversation where both people can be wrong and where if you can see anywhere that you missed some detail, to own that, speak that, say, oh, I didn't actually realize that for you guys, this and this is the case. I didn't realize that. I'm so glad that you said that. That's something I'm going to hold with me. Here's something that I've seen that I'm not sure if you've seen. You might have, but I'm just offering it. You know, it's just, I'm just offering it. It's an invitation. I'm offering it. It's an invitation. You're, you're having faith in people's Buddha nature. You know, you're talking to people's Buddha nature rather than talking to their afflictions. If you talk to their afflictions, then their afflictions respond. If you talk to their Buddha nature, it's more likely that their good heart is what might respond. And all people want to be liked, even if they pretend not to want to be liked. So if they, you know, see that you're likable and want to like them, it's harder for them to be aggressive. Do you know what I mean? Like, they're like, oh, I kind of want to be your friend. Oh, I don't want you to think bad about me, you know? especially family. Anyway, it's, it's something to sit with. So we'll have a little um, half hour break and just kind of be with some of these ideas.